Well, good morning. Boy, these lights are terrific. Um, well, I'm glad to be here this morning. You know, I, many years ago, I think when I was a younger computer salesman, I went to England with a carousel full of slides, 35 millimeter slides, and I found out in England that the light bulbs in those projectors burn a lot hotter than they do in the projectors in the US. And so when I put the slides in, they would actually start to melt at about 14 seconds. So I learned that after that presentation, you know, to flip through it real fast, people came up and said, wow, that was one of the best presentations ever, to stay no longer than 14 seconds a slide. So that's what we're going to do this morning. We're going to move through this very quickly. Um, if I get this going right, the first question, OK. Oh, OK, so we'll start with a polling question. Our company, or our practice, should be become more patient-centric because, if you could plug in anyone from A through F and just see how this comes out. Well, that's pretty good. Patients could achieve better outcomes. I think that was a slam dunk question. I'm kind of glad to see this audience answered that way. Okay, um, this is a shame. There we go. So okay, I'd like to get a, a question real quickly. Who has ridden on a roller coaster? I think everybody here is pretty much, can I just have a quick show? So you know what it's like when you're on that roller coaster and you're going up the hill. It's a real scary scenario that you know you're in for something and as you look at the top and you see what's before you, your heart is racing, you get this hot flash, your blood pressure jumps, and it's a real scary scenario. And that's kind of what it feels like when you're sitting in an oncologist's office and you know you're going to be told that you have cancer and it's rare and it's incurable. So here's the situation. <laughs> okay. So I was told I have a rare incurable blood cancer. Uh, it's a disease. It's a lymphoplasmacytic lymphoma called Waldenstrom macroglobulinemia. No radiation, no surgery, actually no, no uh, treatment option, no standard of care. But the good news is because it's slow growing, the outlook is about five years. So I'd ask you, what would you do in this situation? And what I decided to do is to follow this path of becoming an e-patient. Thank you so much. All right. So, um, so I became this e-patient, which essentially is electronically connected. The most important word on this slide is to become educated. When you're told it's rare and it's incurable, it's being like told you're invited to play a game that you can't win. And I didn't like this scenario. I didn't like the five-year outlook. That was the historical outlook if I went on this path of using these borrowed cancers. So the goal for this presentation is to give them the patient lens, some my observations about precision medicine, some unique insights. Um, I want to talk a little bit about clinical trials and what the shortcomings are and what the opportunities are, and then move on to the, my experiences. What are the patients thinking? What do patients want? The real key buzzword is patient centricity, and I'd like to ask the question, are you serious about that? And then most important, if you leave here today with some information that could save your life, and I think when I'm finished with the presentation, you'll agree I've, I've accomplished that. I'd like to start and quote that great American philosopher, Forrest Gump, that advocates are like a box of chocolates. You never know what you're going to get. And I caution you, when you get together with patient advocates, it doesn't mean that we're, you know, we're capable to understand the technology. We may crash your event. Some are mad. There are some of these misinformed cyberchondriacs. But you have to remember that patients are really no different than the man on the street, except for our experiences. And there's this move. Somebody was talking about PCORI uh, earlier. There's this move to get a group of patients together and to vote and to decide how to do things. And I think that's completely wrong. So be very careful of which patients you listen to, including me. So how do you become this e-patient advocate? I started attending conferences. I started speaking, um, putting posters together to defend the message. And I really wanted to move from adversity to advocacy. And so the key message is that e-patients, we want to become old people. Above all else, that's the primary goal here is to become, become these old people. Here we go. OK, um, I think I'm going to ask you to control this from the back of the room to make this little video work. Can you fire that off? Take it, cheese. 
Anything else? Excuse me, madam. This might do the trick. Oh. At Caltex, our staff will do whatever they can. Thank you so much. You're welcome. To help make your life a little easier. Caltex. So, nice so, and easy. So I think this kind of helps illustrate where we are in healthcare. We're making some basic assumptions that are pretty pretty wrong along the way. I do believe the laughter is the best medicine. This is something I stole from Reader's Digest. I'm still in uh, therapy right now. I get typically an, an infusion once a week. It's a three combination uh, chemo. And one of the things that I do when I'm sitting in the infusion room, I actually been hanging this bottle of Guinness on my infusion rack for years. It's my way of sort of dealing with what could be a scary scenario. Now real quickly, this is kind of, this will be in the slide presentation. Who is this guy, Jack? I've been, just a couple of weeks ago, my wife and I celebrated our 46th uh, anniversary, and if she were here, I'd say, all together, about two years of happiness. No, but, but anyway, outside of the advocacy role, I do have a good, happy family life. Um, we've got three wonderful daughters um, that have created six uh, grandchildren, two sets of twins uh, in that group. Um, but my life is really patient advocacy, um, that includes professional advocacy as a research advocate, patient advocacy, I'm involved in support group, and then legislative advocacy. There's a lot of work at the state and federal level. Um, Julie and I actually testified before a congressional uh, group uh, a few weeks back. Um, I'm also a member of, of ASCO, and I'm involved in the uh, canceling project that they're doing. So for me, this is, um, I blame a lot of this on the effects of dexamethasone, the steroid that keeps me very busy. So here is the situation in 2007, before cancer, considered myself strong, healthy, all good biomarkers, gracefully becoming an old bastard, as they say. The only medication was this 81 milligrams of aspirin. And then after diagnosis, um, the biomarkers were a high concentration of IgM, uh, there's an M spike, the blood chemistry had all of these flags. It indicated there was something wrong in the bone marrow system. The bone marrow is the factory floor, sort of the garden that creates all of these wonderful blood products, red blood cells, white blood cells, platelets, and so forth. So along with those biomarker numbers that weren't looking good, I was very symptomatic, and that included being very tired walking to work. I used to take power walk every day from the train station to the financial district, and I found that it was getting more difficult. I had nosebleeds, some evidence of neuropathy. So it was a combination of bad biomarkers and, and being symptomatic. So having a not yet curable blood cancer is really like a roller coaster, mostly good days and some not so good days, emotional highs and lows, and uncertainty and clarity. And the real key thing, again, was to become this educated patient. So here's what my roller coaster looks like. If I actually plotted out the types of therapeutics that I've had along the way, it looks something like this. But in practice, this is a more accurate representation of my roller coaster. These are important biomarkers that help track the d disease progression and response to certain therapeutics. So if you look up here on the left side, you'll see a bunch of these little yellow triangles. That's a, p a period of uh, what's called plasmapheresis, where you have your blood swapped out. And then you'll look, you'll see some of the green squares. That's a monoclonal antibody, a very popular drug, a rituximab. And then if you look, you'll see these other therapeutics. The blue line, enzostorin, uh, which has been killed off. Um, Everolimus, which today is a breast cancer drug, Afinitor. Uh, and then if you look at the red line, that was probably the best response yet. That's a histone deacetylating drug called panobinostat. Uh, at the time I was taken, it was LBH589. And you'll see this really dramatic drop in this IgM concentration, which is one of the bio biomarkers used to measure this disease progression. And it dropped precipitously. I really got into a very safe zone. And then after about a year on that drug, I had a pretty serious adverse effect, some AFib and then a, a skyrocketing blood pressure that kind of stayed very high. We don't know why that blood pressure kicked in as a result of this targeted therapy, so I had to come off of it. But the good news is, was a year of progression-free survival. And that's the game that I'm playing. 
Now, the other part of this game that's not so clear is that I'm cheating here in clinical trials. Our clinical trials system is broken, and the way I cheat is by tracking my own biomarkers. I'm measuring immediately what the responses are to these therapeutics that I'm taking. Now, when you're involved in study, there's issues of, of placebo and double-blind study, all of those things that biostaticians are really interested in. I'm interested in the care aspect of this, and I want to survive. So when I find out that a therapeutic is not responding or it's not working, I want to get off of it as soon as possible. And that was one of the benefits of tracking my own biomarkers. It answers the basic question that everyone wants to have answered, and that is, how am I doing? So this whole idea of using these biomarkers is another slide. This will be in the presentation. The other biomarkers that were important, hyperviscosity, um, there are a bunch of other issues along the way, and I'm not going to go into that right now. But this sort of illustrates what the responses were to the therapy. So does everybody get that? The real key issue here is for me to get my data to track disease progression and response. And if you're in a situation where you're told it's rare and it's incurable, again, it's like being told it's a game you can't win. I want to beat this game, and I've been thus far it's worked out. So for me, the options were conventional chemotherapy, which include these alkalytic agents and nucleoside analogs. The long-term effect that finding my own research, which has really been published widely now, is what's the long-term effect on the bone marrow, the factory floor, these chemotherapeutic agents, what is the damage that it causes? And we know that myelodysplasia syndrome is a very common severe adverse effect over a long period of time. The alternative of these biologic or targeted agents, and these are the agents I've had if you're interested, monoclonal antibody, proteasome inhibitor. I'm on a next generation proteasome inhibitor today um, called carfilzomib. Um, along with cyclophosphamide, a nasty old 1959 drug I'm not happy about, and, uh, and um, <laughs> a steroid, uh, which is why I'm half crazy. Anyway, the, the, the approach here is to use a combination of the above. So, so for the best patient engagement possible, the real key question is, how am I doing? Give me my data. And data really engages all parties, all parties at the table. It also helps to anticipate the outcome, and most important, to report when you're responding, when you're relapsing, and, and also when you're refractory to a drug. Nobody today, when you're participating in clinical trials, is monitoring this data real time. It's being done in batch mode, and that is absolutely ridiculous. We need to get out of batch mode. We get the biomarker data, we pump, you know, keep punch it up, we email it around, but nobody's looking at it real time to see what the response is. So life sciences, you're measuring the wrong stuff. Patient centricity really requires patient data. So how far have we come in healthcare? I kind of like this slide. This is from an ambulance from Connecticut General Hospital in 1894. And what's interesting about this slide is what you see here on the street, and this is horse manure. And you can look this up, but there was a great horse manure crisis of 1894 in London and New York, and they were predicting that there was going to be a need to shut it down. People were extrapolating forward, saying this path that we're on, we can't survive in our cities. And it's kind of the same situation that we're on today in healthcare. If we extrapolate forward the basic technology where we are today, we're going to come up to the same con con conclusions that they did in 1894 with the horse manure crisis. But what's happened in 1894 was the internal combustion engine was under development. We have that here with precision medicine or personalized medicine. And I really do think that that's the solution. This precision medicine initiative um, brought to us by the free enterprise system, not by the government, is going to be the solution. So just to talk briefly, I think everyone's familiar with this whole, you know, the genomic-based therapy. On the left is this empirical approach, which most of us get in, the, in our standard of care. You try drug A. If it fails, you move on to drug B and so forth. And this is sort of like this, this whack-a-mole game. You try drug A, move on to drug B, and so forth. I actually gave this presentation in Germany a few weeks ago, and that's called Wach ein Moivuf, and they, it's a very popular game in Germany. The whole idea was knock down the agent, but this is really the approach, is to using a genomics-based therapy, do the genetic testing, and determine ahead of time which of the drugs are going to be safer and more effective. We're not there yet, but we're heading in this right direction. 
A key issue I think that remains outstanding is the companion diagnostic that we use in the lab to develop these therapeutics. We need to move those companion diagnostics out into the clinics. We have to actually have to taste, test the safety and efficacy of the drug at the time it's given to the patient. And the issue is who's going to pay for the companion diagnostics? Pharmaceutical and biotech companies don't want to pay, and certainly the payers don't want to pay. But somebody has to come up with a solution to this companion diagnostics. I think, I think we'll ultimately get there. So the whole idea with personalized medicine is to use information about our genes and proteins, as we talked about last night, and the environment to prevent and diagnose and treat disease. And I really do believe this biomarker testing is so critical. And there are many levels of biomarker. There's basic biomarker when you go to the doctor's office, and then the more detailed molecular biomarkers that we need to get out into the general population. The whole idea is to look at this population and find which of those that are most likely to respond. Now, what this industry is facing, I think there are two key obstacles. The distribution channel right now doesn't facilitate communications between the patient and the people who develop the therapeutic. We just, there's a healthcare provider in the intermediary. There's no way to talk directly to me when I'm, when I'm on a clinical trial. And that's a shame, we need to fix that. The regulatory environment actually prevents, it discourages any free flow of information between the patient and the people that are developing this, this, these therapeutics. So if we, using patient data, we can close this loop. And as I said earlier, we start with biomarkers to answer that question, how am I doing? And that measurement of patient data is really what patient centricity is about. So if you look at this slide here, for me, what the key issues here was, when was I relapsing? And when I saw these relapse periods coming, that's when I could raise my hand, go to my oncologist and say, it's time to move on to another drug. And that's not the way clinical trials are done today. We put together cohorts and arms, and we were focused on subjects rather than on patients. And this is what I mean by cheating, by taking the system as, as it's in place right now and going around it. So um, I think it's very important that pharma establish a good relationship with patients in a, in a very different way than most is just when it's mostly talked about in this industry. Don't give us stuff. Ask the patients to help you. I think patients can be your most, the strongest advocate. I'm an advocate in many ways for pharma, in legislative circles and in policy circles. The, the, for me, the key message here is that targeted agents that are in clinical trials, they may be more effective and they may be, may be safer than conventional chemotherapy. And this is not something that you typically hear in the pharma industry today. Patient and research advocates can be your partner and your voice in business and policy and legislative advocacy. Now, another issue is don't listen to everything the patients say, especially me. Don't be so re risk averse, and I think this industry should be bold, much bolder than it is. This whole risk averse attitude, I think, doesn't serve us well. Science has never been better, and we really need to educate regulators rather than fearing them and stop being a chicken. This industry is totally so, so scared to move. We need to get out of that mode. The impact of the he heavily regulated environment, as I said, the distribution channel doesn't facilitate this two-way communication. The regulatory environment prevents that open communications. And as I said, the, the, the whole industry is risk averse. Finally, this, the issue of HIPAA compliance and EU data privacy, this has been preventing a lot of the good epidemiology studies that we need to pull, and we've not been able to do that. So the financial to toxicity, I think, is a key issue. I'm not going to be able to go into that in detail, but there are many broken promises, particularly for seniors and veterans. The pharmaceutical cost versus medical cost is an issue we've not addressed squarely. But you know, since 1969, the cost of pharmaceuticals are still only 10% of the total cost of, of, of health care. And we need to get payers on board with the changing landscape here. The fact that I can sit in an infusion room and get chemotherapy at a cost of $50,000 a month and have it covered 100%, but yet if I want a biologic or a molecular targeting agent in pill form, which is considered pharmacy co coverage, I have a coinsurance of, in this real world number, is $28.13 a month. It makes no sense. And the payers have been fighting us on this for years. That's the oral parity bill. 
You know, this is an example where we're shooting ourselves in the foot. I can get 100% coverage if I sit in an infusion chair, but again, if I stay at home, I have a very high coinsurance of 20 to 25%. You're not aware of this until you become a senior and you find out about things like donut holes, and I think as it was discussed earlier, it's a real serious problem. It's also a serious problem in the VA. I love the VA. I'm a disabled American veteran. I never used the VA after coming home from overseas. My whole life, I didn't rely on it until I went, until I turned 65. And one of the promises that we would provide you pharmacy coverage, but none of the drugs that I need are on the VA formulary. These are examples of things that we need to fix as a nation that need to get completely changed. So anyway, I'm, I'm going to move on. Why we need to support biopharma and the life sciences industry, we can dramatically reduce the, the cost of health care. You know, there's a, there's a solution to this, and I think we missed it completely. If you want to dramatically reduce the cost of health care and drugs, why don't we make drugs that the federal government buys for CMS and for the VA, why don't we make them tax exempt, just like the weapons that we create for the Department of Defense? When defense contractors build weapons, they're sold, they're, they're sold tax-free. Why don't we do the same thing with drugs? You know, Congress likes to beat up this industry. People have been talking about the profiteering that's going on in this industry. If we were serious about fixing this damn problem, make the drugs available tax-free. Why should I, as a patient, have to pay for that 40% tax bracket that we put on corporations? You can go run to Canada and buy the drugs at a discount, but the Canadian tax rate is 16%. You can go to Switzerland with a corporate tax rate of 16%. The UK, France, and Germany, they're all half of what our federal tax rate is. So if we're really serious about the price of this, why don't we price them? We know it already works. We did this with orphan drugs. As soon as we gave these tax incentives, we went from 30 orphan drugs a year to somewhere around 300. This could really change if we wanted to do it, but nobody wants to do it, and Congress won't act on this. But I'm telling you, it is a very simple solution sell these drugs tax exempt. We can't sustain the way we're doing remedial care. We need to get into this preventive and prognostic care. Finally, I think this is so important. We've got to support this industry. As I said before, this, this is the industry that creates jobs, it feeds our families, and pays our taxes. This industry is under attack right now, and I'm telling you, as a patient, I see firsthand the noble work that people in life sciences are doing. Nobody's standing up for you guys. In research advocacy, it's so important that we provide rational funding, funding for biomedical research. You know, last year, we increased the NIH budget by a half a percent. That's absolutely ridiculous. Doesn't keep up with the cost of inflation. If you looked at the total NIH budget and divided it by the population in the U.S., it's less than $100 per person. But yet, we spend $8,750 per person for the cost of health care. Something is out of balance. We need to fix that. Legislative advocacy, I'm telling you, our lawmakers are getting more involved in policies every day. These are some of the things that I think are important. The oral parity bill, the biosimilars clarification. Biosimilars are on the horizon. We have to be careful that a biosimilar or biologic agent is not chosen because it's lower cost, like a generic drug. The step ther therapy, the whole idea of fail first and then move on to a lower cost drug or a more expensive drug along the way. We need to fix that. The 21st Century Cures Bill, which is up with a very good chance of passing, really increases funding for NIH. And it also helps in what the, the initiative that ASCO has underway to enable the free flow of patient data, make it interoperable. So how much time do I have? Uh, I think we're almost pretty good on track. So for clinical trials, um, this is a, a slide I stole from a friend of mine, Ken Getz, at Tufts uh, University. And this was on the cover of Time magazine in uh, 2009. And what's interesting, you know, this whole story about we patients are becoming human guinea pigs and we're being abused and it's a terrible environment. The sad thing about this particular issue was what happened, the following issue. Nobody from this industry came forward and said, you know, that's a bunch of bull, that we're not a bunch of human guinea pigs. There's so many myths and misconceptions about clinical trials. So n nobody on any side came back to say that this kind of stuff is wrong. You get this almost weekly now on 60 Minutes on, on TV shows bashing the industry. And I can tell you, as a patient, 
you get to look at this thing very clinically and very objectively, and you say, is it responding, is it working? Um, so here's the problem we have, is this research centricity rather than patient-centric environment. It's really scaled on the side of research today as opposed to treatment. If you look at what's going on in the lab versus what's going on in the clinic, and you look at what's going on with the protocol, which has a higher priority than the patient. So this sort of recentricity, research centricity, which is underway, we need to change it. And we, the only way to get complete balance is to fully disclose the data using current information technology. Now, finally, why do I participate in clinical trials? These are the key things, and perhaps one of the most important. People talk about you're doing it for some altruistic reason. Trust me, I am not doing this for the benefit of my fellow man. I'm doing this because I want to survive. If I can survive, if I can beat this thing, there's a whole bunch of altruistic things that I can do that go far beyond just contributing for the benefit of my man. Perhaps the most important reason is right here. Is this is the real reason why I'm involved in clinical trials. I, I hope to survive for a long time and, uh, and enjoy the benefits of my three daughters and granddaughters. Anyway, any questions? All right, thank you. Thanks so much. Okay. That was a little high speed. That's about a two-hour infusion done over 30 minutes. So, so I do have yeah. one question. Yeah, yeah. Sure. So of the yeah. different agents you've had, yeah. most mm -hmm. of them look to me that they were not on label. So right. how many of those yeah. were clinical trial participation, yeah. and how many of those did you manage yeah. to get outside of a trial, yeah. and how did you do that? And yeah. is that your advocacy? Is that yeah. your independent wealth? I mean, no. how does that all work? <laughs> okay, everyone was a clinical trial. Everyone and, was and the only benefit of having... Uh, a rare and curable blood cancer is there's no standard of care. So I always knew I was getting the good stuff. There was never a placebo, but I could also, even if I were getting a placebo and there was not a good response, I'd know, know yeah. the results. And, so, and yeah. you were doing all this where? At Dana-Farber Dana in Boston. And, yeah. and you're based yeah. in Boston. I am, yeah. Because yeah. that's yeah. another piece of the opportunity, right? Yeah, yeah. You can't, you know, you can't do that everywhere. Well, you know, that's beginning to change, that a, num a number of the major academic institutions are reaching out to smaller regional practices, and uh, because a lot of these agents are now pill form, you don't have to sit in an infusion chair. I happen to be in an infusion chair because it's an old-style drug that I'm, on, I'm back on right now. So... All right, well, and appreciate the yeah. candor. Thank yeah, you. Yeah, thanks so much. Okay, great. All right, so. Thank you.